this year, sir. Um, take for just a moment, th think of the big picture of our church. We exist for five reasons. We spent quite a bit of time the first part of this year talking about the five reasons that we exist to worship, to serve, to grow, to connect, to go. Those are the five reasons we exist. We have eight different core values that bear out that vision statement. We say it with one phrase, find purpose in Christ and share. That is to say, find your purpose, your meaning, the, the true reason for your existence. Find that in Christ Jesus, get grounded in him. And then once you do find that, be sure and share because there's many other people who long for what we have found. This, this year, the Lord put on my heart to have five different seasons as a church. We had a season of worship. Right now, we're in a season of serving. And um, here's what I'm asking you to do. We kicked off this season of serving two weeks ago with a volunteer day, volunteering for our city and just blessing them, painting, picking up debris, trash and cleaning and it was a hot day too some of you know what i'm talking about god bless you the ones who did that in a couple of weeks uh, as this moves on over the next few weeks in fact we're going to have a list of different things around the church that just need to get done and i'm praying that hey it's your serve that you will just get involved and find a place where you can serve behind the scenes as unto the lord you'll see the list and you'll see the different things that are coming up and I know that one of those things, maybe several of them, would just really touch your heart in a special way and you're going to serve. The other thing I asked to do, and I, I didn't do that good at it myself this last week, I said, if you catch someone in an act of serving, I want you to take your phone out right there, take their picture, and then post it on social media. I got a couple of pictures and I'm going to add this next week, but let me, let me just warn you, this, this coming week and the next several weeks, I'm a pastor with a phone, and I know how to use it. <laughs> and so if, if I catch you serving, I hope that you will use the hashtag, It's Your Serve, and put it on social media and just spread it around. Well, the sermon today is titled, Out of Reverence. Out of Reverence. Probably you're familiar with Ephesians chapters 5 and 6, because those two chapters are some of the most... Um, I guess recognize scripture that you can find just about anywhere in the Bible. Um, chapter 5 is a very important commandment from, from God. Paul wrote it this way. He said, be filled with the Spirit. Amen. And then in chapter 6, it describes how we are to enter into spiritual warfare with our prayers and, and with our participation in what God's doing. By the way, chapter 6, that is one of those quintessential, you know, the, the warfare of, of God, the, the weapons of our warfare, and, and that, whole, that whole section is so uh, very special. I think it's probably recognized more than just about any, any scripture, that's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where it's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. Um, but here's what I would like you to notice. In my Bible, in chapter 5, just before it says, Be filled with the Spirit, it has the subheading, Living in the Spirit's power. And then the very next part, part where it starts talking about husbands, wives, children, uh, workers, co-workers, uh, slaves, masters, bosses, all of that, it comes under the heading uh, that says Spirit-Guided Relationships. And then it brings it full circle when it does start talking about the whole armor of God, how very important it is for us to live in the Spirit of God. So how do you do that? How, how do you live in the Spirit of God? How do you put on the full armor of God? How do you live in such a way that you can engage in spiritual warfare? It's just very interesting to me that in between these two headings about life in the Spirit, in between those two headings are some very interesting and important texts about very 
practical teaching. And the teaching goes along the line of how to interact with people in your circle of acquaintances. It seems to me that the Apostle Paul wanted to say, if you want to be a Spirit-filled person, a person who lives by the Spirit, then craft your skills about how you're going to interact and serve the people in your circle of acquaintances. Sometimes we don't think of that as something very spiritual, but I promise you, it's, it's super spiritual the way that we present ourselves as a servant. So, from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, all the way to chapter 6, verse 9. Now, that's a long portion of Scripture. But in that portion of Scripture, you will find just about every relationship that there is. Just about every relationship that exists, whether it's husband, wife, children, parents, worker, co-worker, boss. It, it's all there. Now, it would be impossible for us to read that in the Scripture. It just wouldn't be very practical to read um, all of those verses. And I'm not going to do that. It's just too much for one sermon. In fact, uh, I, I toyed with the idea of breaking this up into multiple messages. It could be a series on, it, on its own. But we're not going to do that. Um, but what we are going to do, we're just going to look at some of the highlights in each paragraph. And I hope that you catch hold of, of the, the theme, the, the motif if you will, that ties these verses together. Now, notice how the section begins with verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is Ephesians 5.21. It is the overarching theme for everything that we're going to read in all of these verses going through chapter 6. It definitely is the overarching theme for the verses that follow immediately. The next verses that we have are about the relationship between a husband and a wife. And here's what we need to know, that it starts off by saying to both, I would say it's saying to all relationships, but especially immediate context, both husband and wife Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Submit. Now, I think possibly this verse is one of the most misquoted, misused verses in all the Bible. I heard of a man one time who told his pastor, I don't know what the problem is. I'm doing everything right. Well, tell me a little bit about your relationship. Well, preacher, the Bible says that the wife should submit to the husband. So I told her, woman, you submit to me. <laughs> How's that working out for you? <laughs> I mean, this, this verse is really just one of the most misrepresented verses. Um, first off, I mean, if, if you tell someone to submit to you, chances are about 99.9% .9 that that's not going to go well. And just, I don't think we have any men like that in here, but just guys, think about it. If you were on the receiving end of that comment, you will submit to me. And that go over like a lead balloon in my conversation. Just not happening. Here, here's an amazing thing. Husbands, if you will love your wife and surrender to the Lord and serve your wife, it makes this amazing environment where a wife just loves to honor her husband. Right. Amen. It's just amazing how that works. Um, but not only this verse, but all of these verses following. Uh, interestingly, you don't read in these verses anywhere where it says serve your church in fact you're going to be hard pressed to find a verse in the bible that says serve your church 
Now certainly I think that is a biblical concept, and I think it can be borne out from, from the Bible. Uh, but he, here's really the thing about it. Um, it here's, here's what I believe. When you, when you serve people, what is the church made of? People. And that's not to say, like just a, a moment earlier, I mentioned we're going to have some projects listed and there's things that need to get done around the church, you know, and, and we're hoping that a lot of people will respond and sign up and yeah, that they'll take care of things. I think that's beautiful, beautiful ministry. But the Bible doesn't speak of it that way. And this is what we practice. This is what I believe. We grow by growing people. I believe that we as a church grow by growing people. And when you minister to people, then the church naturally grows. I want to point out to you three different themes this morning as we're looking at this sort of a bird's eye view, an overview of Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6. Three, di three different themes about serving. And the first one is this, serving by covenant. Serving by covenant. Let me just say this. If you are in the room, and if you are not married, but you want to be married, I personally, I, I hate to be in a service, listening to a sermon, and I think, well, that doesn't really apply to my life right now. But I, I want to just say, um, if that's a true desire of your heart, I believe God will honor that desire in His timing. I believe that He'll give you that. And there, there are some people that do not want to be married, and that's fine if that's your calling in life, if that's the lot where you are. But there are still things that we can each take from this, but for a moment I am specifically speaking to husband and wife the married couples of our church. Wife, how do you serve your husband? As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now, it takes a special calling to be a wife. When I minister to young couples that are considering getting married, by the way, <laughs> Nick and Taylor, we had a beautiful wedding here Monday, and they're on their way to Colorado, um, even today for a family vacation. Nick will travel with his new bride to get her back into the barracks there, fly back here, and then on August 6th, you are all invited to the public gathering. We're, we're really wanting to celebrate that. Um, it's just such a special time for our family. But, but when I meet with a, a pre-marriage uh, counseling session with a couple, there's, there's different tools that I use. The most recent one has, I think, 119 questions on it. Each, the husband and, and wife, or uh, soon to be husband and wife, they, they take the test individually. They're not allowed to see what the other one answers. They do it on their own, and, and then it, it spits out a lot of questions for talking points to go over. And, and one of the things that I say is, you know, for, for a wife, it doesn't mean ever, it never means that you're a doormat. That is not what the Bible ever intended. Here's what a healthy marriage looks like. Husband gives his opinion. Wife gives her opinion. They talk it through. They try to look at it from every angle. Most of the time, there's great agreement. But on those rare occasions, on the rare occasions when there's just disagreement and a decision has to be made, then the Bible is clear. Husband, you're going to stand before God. You better make sure you've prayed. And you say to your wife, sweetheart, I just disagree with you. on the, I've heard you. I know it's important to you. But I really feel that we need to go this way. And the Bible bears out that when the wife says, okay, and surrenders, there is something very, very beautiful that, about that. It brings the couple together in cohesion. Husband, how do you serve your wife? Just as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? 
And he stretched out his arms and died yes. for her. He loved her so much. And so, but what I want you to notice about both of these for the wife, she is to look to Christ for her model about surrendering. And for the husband, he is to look for Christ to Christ for his model of what it meant to love his church. Um, I'm going to take just a moment as we're talking about husband and wife to, to talk about one area that I'm deeply concerned about, one specific area, and that is sexuality. Here's, here's a strange thing about sex. You can tend to think that, se that sex is very self-gratifying. And of course it's gratifying. But I believe time proves over the long haul of your marriage that sex is more about serving your spouse than it is about serving yourself. Japan, as a nation, is in a state of crisis. It's really remarkable to read about. Uh, they're in danger of becoming a sexless society. Huge numbers of young people are not only avoiding marriage, but many of them are avoiding sexual relationships altogether. This has led to some creepy adaptations. Uh, in Japan, they now have uh, lifelike talking dolls for the elderly who don't have grandchildren. Isn't that a little creepy? They even have this thing where you can be a grandparent for a day. You can borrow someone else's grandchild and be a grandparent for a day. I mean, all over the nation. Remarkable. But listen to this. They have replaced sex with sexting, using the internet for gratification, or they're using no commitment, one-time casual sex. It falls under the heading of what's called in their culture pot noodle love, pot noodle love. It's about easy, instant gratification, and it, it involves videos, virtual reality girlfriends. It involves anime cartoons. Or else they are opting out altogether and they're replacing love uh, and sex with other, other urban pastimes. And, and unless you think I'm joking, this is a very serious problem. By the year 2060, Japan will have reduced its population by one-third if the crisis isn't averted. And at the root of it all is selfishness. Selfishness. Because the, the uh, young women are not wanting to get married because they want to have a career. And they know that in order to make it uh, in, in, uh, in the culture where you, you, the corporate world is just vicious, and it, unless you're willing to give it your all, you're not going to make it. A lot of times the CEOs will not hire a young married woman because she's going to get pregnant, and then she's going to quit on us, and so we're just not going to do it. And so a lot of times they are being selfish and putting career goals over family goals. A lot of the men are being selfish. The corporate world requires that the men give many hours. It's not uncommon for a man to work a 14-hour day in the corporate world in Japan. And men know that if they're going to make it, then they've got to do that. And they won't have time for a wife and children. Or they know that if they're going to make it, they have to have two salaries. But how can they marry a wife who can't get a job? Because if she gets married, then she won't be able to get a job. So, they are selfishly just avoiding marriage, avoiding the sexual gift from God altogether. Here's the amazing thing. The great lie was that the sexual revolution just said, live free. Just live any way you want. Gratify every desire. Boy, you're going to be free. You're just going to enjoy all the sex you want. The irony is that at the end of that, people are having less sex and they're avoiding marriage entirely. It's a lie. And so Paul, he, he reiterates something at verse number 33. He says, so again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. 
So if you're here as a married person, if you are married, ask yourself, how can I serve my spouse? How can I serve my spouse this week? Is there something I could do to serve my spouse? Now, the, the second point this morning is serving my bloodline. So, interestingly, the first one was serving by covenant. The, the thing about husband and wife, uh, they're, not, they're not blood relatives. I mean, by law, you're not allowed to be blood relatives. That kind of, you know, well, I guess there are parts in the hills of Arkansas. And, no, never no, wait. Tony. So you are not blood relatives, but the amazing thing is you come together and through the beauty of intimacy, you become one. And just think about the act of marriage, how it defines a bloodline and changes it forever. And how many thousands and thousands of generations has this happened with? It's truly amazing. So um, in the first point, we're talking about husband and wife. They have, they have a covenant. And I, I believe in covenant. I, I do not believe in this idea of no fault divorce. That is one of the biggest lies that the enemy has tried to allow to creep in the back door of our nation. I thank God that we enter into covenant in relationship of marriage with one another. It's important. But now the second thing is your bloodline. Uh, if you, or if you're like me, if you're a husband and if you were there for the birth of your child, do you have words for it? I mean, I am blown away uh, that at one moment my wife is there, she's on the, the bed or the gurney or I, and she's pregnant. And she has been pregnant, Heather, for nine months. <laughs> and then, all of the sudden, in the next moment, there's a new human being in the room. And he's crying. And he's got dad's little pointed ear. <sighs> no words. No words. You have a bloodline. So, children, how do you serve your parents? Obey your parents. Why? Because you belong to the Lord. Here it is again. We're going back to our relationship with Jesus Christ. You obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. And because it's the right thing to do. Fathers, how do you serve your children? With the discipline and instruction. What? That comes from the Lord. You see, it's always about the Lord. How does a husband treat his wife? He looks at how Jesus lived. How does a wife treat her husband? She looks at the model. How do children obey their parents? Because the Lord said to do it. How do, how do dads take care of disciplining the children? If they, because that's what comes from the Lord. You see, it's always all about the Lord. That this entire portion of Scripture comes under the banner out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Strange, strange thing is happening in current culture in which individuals feel like I mean, this is a strange phenomenon. More and more, there are individuals who feel like family is a bother instead of a blessing. I don't get that. I don't understand what happens. I'm not saying with people in our church family. I've not observed that, but I have observed that very readily in current culture. Sort of as, as if, if I just didn't have all these kids, boy, what the things I could do. You know? But family is a blessing. Amen. And lest you think that what's happening over in Japan isn't happening here, it's happening here. We're following the same trajectory, only about, they say, a decade or two behind. But the same trends are happening in the United States. 
So I truly encourage you. You've been blessed with an amazing family. You have brothers, sisters, mom, dad, grandparents, possibly some of your grandparents still living, aunts, uncles. You, you have foster children, adopted children. You have an amazing family. And so I just speak to you that to find out this week, ask yourself, you know, how can I serve my family? What could I do to be a better servant to them? And I, I'm not talking about, you know, reading commentaries from 3 to 4 a.m. and praying from 4 to 5 a.m. And I, I'm talking about washing the dishes, taking out the trash, making the bed, even if she remakes it after you make it. <laughs> Just do stuff. To just be nice. Go out of your way to serve your bloodline. You will never regret it. Then the third area is serving humanity. Just humanity in general. So it, it, he starts with his covenant relationship, husband and wife. And then he begins to speak of those who by virtue of the bloodline they come in to, to your life. But now he talks about just serving all of your community around you, all of your circle of acquaintances. He says um, that, that we should serve this way. How does the employee serve the boss? By the way, I'm using the word employee and the word boss because that is, that's the dynamic that Paul was getting to in the first century. He was not saying slave and master in the sense that we, we think of uh, the deep south, the antebellum south, and the horrors of slavery in our culture. That was not the same concept that would enter into the mind of people living in the Roman world. Many of the slaves in the Roman world were more like indentured servants. They, many of them were doctors, dentists, librarians, uh, gardeners, uh, respected people. And so he's really, he's really talking about the relationship of a boss and an employee. How does the employee serve the boss? As you would serve Christ. So you're working on a job, you're thinking, oh, man, I just can't stand my boss. That, that guy's got it in for me. Just, oh, why is he always doing this? Doesn't he know? But, but the Bible says the same way that you serve Christ, you should serve your boss as slaves of Christ. Do you see that? And, and the interesting thing, of course, yet again, it comes back to our model, Jesus Christ. If I'm a good worker, I'm going to serve my boss the same way that I serve Christ. It's as if I'm a slave to Christ, and I'm showing that through the way I do everything I do. And by the way, it's not only, hear this, it's not only the worker to the boss. But how does the boss treat his employees Remember, you both have the same master Amen. in heaven. If you think, well, these people are just here to serve me, to build my kingdom, to make me money. No, no. You are to, to honor them because you know someday you're going to stand before the master in heaven. And both of you will be on equal footing. And you want to be able to say... I did the best I could for my employees. I provided benefits for them when I was able. I honored them. And, and in so doing, I elevated them. I made them better. I made life better for them. But it all comes back to that idea. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In India, there's 1.27 billion people 2,100 unreached people groups. 2,100 unreached people groups in India alone. I was reading uh, a while back from what's called the Live Dead Journal. Um, fall of 2015 issue. If you're not familiar with Live Dead, it's this amazing ministry in the Assemblies of God. And it literally takes this concept of dead and really what the idea is about 
It's, it's a targeted effort to plant churches using teams of people and to plant them all along the northern coast of Africa and all throughout India and other regions in the Middle East, all of the major coastal cities. It's really a God thing that uh, is happening. I, I was uh, visiting with one of our missionaries recently, just hearing his heart about what God is doing. I'm just, I'm blown away. It's, it's being received with, with great uh, acceptance, having great impact. But in this journal last fall, they were talking about how Live Dead India, Live Dead India is looking for key people to serve, to serve their community, to, to serve the nation of India. And they're calling upon people from all over the United States. In fact, if you have in your heart that maybe there's some way you could be involved, this might be a fantastic ministry experience for some of you. By the way, the reason that we didn't go on the missions trip back in 2015, we planned to go, but there was social upheaval and unrest in the part of Western India that we were planning to go to. And the missionary told us, you really better pray about whether you come or not. We did pray about it, and we took his advice. We ended up sending an offering of blessing and purchasing a new water well in India. And uh, we we saved back the remainder of that money to regroup and plan for another missions trip later on. But here's that they are experiencing severe turmoil. Churches being burned. Christians being persecuted. Oh, but I thought they were all pacifists in India. No. It's getting, it's getting really dangerous. So here's the interesting thing. This Live Dead Journal, they're talking about the things they're looking for. They're looking for artists, Gym trainers, architects, teachers, writers, photographers, business people, outdoor adventurers, coffee shop baristas. They're, that's who they're looking for because that's who they're using as teams to plant churches. As government scrutiny and restrictions rise, opportunities for traditional missions for the Indians and for foreigners too are closing. And uh, one of the team members, a pastor, says this, listen, I love this quote, quote, what we see as a negative thing may actually be the work of the Holy Spirit, allowing us to start new and to do it right. Increasingly in the days ahead, we will have no choice but to come into this country with legitimate platforms like jobs, businesses, and companies. Sharing Christ will have to come as an overflow of sharing life as we live side by side with people making genuine relationships. One other quote, I thought this is so good from this article, and this is a quote from one of the team members who is a trainer, works out with people in the gymnasium, and he says, and by the way, they're having like five nights a week where they offer free aerobics and free weightlifting and, and all kinds of things like this. And they're having standing room only crowds turning people away. And uh, he says, quote, something happens when we work out, sweat, and feel pain together. Men soften. They open up. Relationships become easier to build. And conversation happens naturally. That's the model our missionaries are using to reach into heavily populated Muslim countries and to have impact. You heard the testimony just last week of Jay Brown, how they are seeing impact by doing this very model of teens planting churches. Okay, so we've talked about covenant, bloodline, humanity. What's the big idea? Look at your neighbor and say, what's the big idea? Make the memory of you matter by showing reverence to Christ. Make the memory of you matter by showing reverence to Christ. It's Memorial Day weekend. We're remembering. We are memorializing 
individuals and, and thinking back and reflecting and realizing how blessed we are. You know, someday, whether you serve in the armed services or not, someday people are going to remember you. Someday, and I think it's going to be many, many years from now, but one of these years, we're going to bring you in a box and put you right here in front of everybody. We're going to go out to the graveyard and we'll cry a few tears. And then we're going to come back here and eat fried chicken and talk about you. <laughs> Amen. And what will we say? Oh, my. <laughs> Make the memory matter. How do you do that? You do that out of reverence for Christ. That is to say, if I'm a husband, I'm going to just serve my wife. I've got two kids. Boy, I'm going to pour everything i got into them. i got people on my job around me. I'm going to just show them I appreciate them and I love them. I'm going to be there for them and help them. I'm going to be the kind of person, if they've got too much on their plate, I'm just going to step up and say, Hey, could I do that for you? Yes. <clears throat> and someday, when the chicken is finger licking good, they're going to say, here's what I remember about old Keith Howard. I think it's really, um, it's very fitting the way Paul wraps this whole section up. Because He's talking about how to live by the Spirit. I mean, really, to be filled with the Spirit. And, and to engage in spiritual battle. Well, that's a great concept, Paul, but how do we do that? Well, I'll tell you how. Husband, wife, children, father, co-worker, next-door neighbor, gas station attendant. I don't know. Do they have those anymore? I don't know. But... That's how you do it in, in a very practical way. You, you just give. You give, give, give out of reference for Christ. And then he wraps it up by talking, what it's, talking about what it's really like to be a soldier. And this is why I think it's fitting for Memorial Day weekend. He gives us this final word about engaging in warfare and, and just putting on weaponry to be able to do battle against the enemy. I want you, as I read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, I want you to simply picture it in this framework. Because I, I think that we, we think, yeah, boy, get shield of faith, sword of the Word of God, and I've got my helmet of salvation. We picture, we imagine stuff, but picture it this way. What would it be like if I launched an all-out attack against the enemy over my husband, my wife, my children, my co-worker, my neighbor? What would that look like? And so hear it fresh and new. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Pray in the Spirit at all times, on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Amen. Amen. I want to end the service this morning by having you recite an enlistment into God's army. You see, when a soldier 
becomes a soldier. He takes an oath. She takes an oath to serve. She would say these words. He would say these words. I, Keith Howard, do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to do the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations and the uniform code of military justice, so help me God. I would to recite a new pledge that enlists each one of us in God's army. I want you to think about the words before you repeat after me. I know normally when you repeat something, you just hear it, you speak it immediately. Weigh it, think about it, speak it out if you agree. Don't worry if, if the cadence gets a little bit off with the whole group, because we're each weighing these things. <clears throat> But if you really mean it, then speak it out. I want everyone to stand to your feet. Raise your right hand. You're going to speak your name instead of my name. I, Keith Howard, do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend the Holy Bible. The word, of God the word of God against all enemies, against all enemies spiritual, spiritual and, legislative, and legislative that I will bear true witness to what Jesus has done in my life. And that I will obey the orders of my commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that I will obey the orders of the commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a lot of words. I think you got the heart of it. Let's say that one again. And that I will obey the orders of my commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And the vision of the leaders appointed over me. So help me God. So help me God. Now if you mean it, you've already got one hand up. Let's lift them both up and just surrender. Oh God, we just surrender to you. We are warriors in your army. We want to be obedient. Commander in chief, lead us where you want us. Take us to where you want us to be. Let us serve our way into a great impact upon our city. Let us be servants, God. Yes. Serving our spouse, if that's Hallelujah. for some of us. Hallelujah. Serving our children. Hallelujah. Serving our neighbors, our co-workers. Serving family members. Papa yes. and Grandma and aunts and uncles and cousins. And Lord, you've blessed us so much. Let us be your servants, we pray. Yes. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Hey, yeah, God bless you. Just a moment, some music's going to start to play, and I just want to wish you the happiest Memorial Day weekend that you could ever have. I hope you get to enjoy it with friends and family. And before you leave, take time to hug someone around the neck and just, uh, you know, be friendly and enjoy some good fellowship. God bless all of you. Have a great weekend.